Hi, I'm Katie Archer with CTV5. I'm here today with Dan and Renee with Cami Grove Charter School. Thanks for joining me today. Uh, my first question is, is it time to change education paradigms and why? Hmm. Well, <laughs> I've worked with kids for many years and I always hear this question. <laughs> why do I need to know this? When will this ever benefit me? And that question was kind of the thing that sparked um, a yes for me inside your question because I want kids to learn in a way that they don't have to ask that question. That they hear a concept, they get a chance to understand where that concept fits in in their, in their school education and then the school will be able to support that in a way that the learning becomes real and tangible for them. I think it's an interesting question too because we know how um, things are changing so fast um, at this day and age. I just heard on the radio earlier today that jobs 15 years from now are going to be um, completely different from what exists today. The way that te technology is changing things and new innovations and kids, they might be interested in some doing something that that job doesn't even exist for them by the time they get out of college. So the way that we educate young people has to change. They need to be able to um, think creatively, innovate, um, be problem solvers, be able to work as a team and collaborate together. So these are all of the types of skills that we think are really the foundation of the charter school that we're proposing. We want young people to be able to think critically and to work together, to be able to look at the big picture and think, what could be different in this situation? How could I make a difference? What could I do to change the world? And grow up having the confidence to believe that they could be the people that really do um, do that when they are young adults. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, so what is a charter school? Charter school is a school that is a state-funded school, but it is allowed to run by a charter that's been approved, and a charter is a kind of a mission statement. <clears throat> and so what happens is if, if our charter school is approved here in Canby, the money for each child will come from the state through the Canby School District, and then they keep a percentage of it to help monitor um, how our school's doing and help support us, and they pass through the money here, and so we get a chance to educate children according to the charter and kind of the values that we've set in place. So really it's, it's a public school, but it gives us the ability to maybe um, do some things differently than what we see in traditional education. Uh, one thing that's distinctive is just the environment here at the camp. We were just talking earlier and saying how fun would it have been when we were eight years old to feel like you're going to summer camp every day. You know, it becomes exciting for the kids and it becomes interesting and they're more engaged in their learning when things are hands-on and experiential and they can begin to apply what they're learning to the activities that they're doing. And here in the Northwest, we all love the outdoors, right? So I, I think it's gonna be um, something that kids can be really excited about being in this environment. What are some obstacles of starting a charter school? <laughs> Renee? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a lot more involved than uh, anyone realizes. Um, we have to think of, of every area from curriculum to budgeting to um, risk management to how we're going to hire teachers. You know, we have to think about every single area that's involved in a, a public school and we have to create a proposal um, to, to, to do that, to function well. So um, you know, we put together a great team. We had a, a fantastic steering committee that brought a lot of different um, knowledge and wisdom and experience and um, skills that they had. So we were able to have different people speaking into all of those different areas. Uh, but I think, you know, the biggest challenge probably for us has just um, been in being able to um, really find, a, I guess it comes down to the finances, because we get 80% of what the school um, will get for every student. Uh, our budget is al already limited, and so we have to think about how can we do these innovative um, things that we want to do on a limited budget? 
And so we've gone over that one again and again and again and again. Uh, once we're able to, once we get the approval from the district, then we'll be able to apply for some grants and be able to do some fundraising. But until we're actually a school, we're very limited in even being able to raise extra funding. Yeah. Why are some communities against charter schools? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure. I have some theories. Around this area, every school district surrounding Canby has one or multiple charter schools in it. And uh, the reason they have found success is because it doesn't steal kids from the existing school typically. What it does is it um, wins back <clears throat> um, non-traditional learning, learning type kids, kids that have been homeschooled, kids that have been in private school, uh, kids that have been in charter schools in other districts. Parents often want to have them home in their own district. And so what school, district, school districts have typically found is that instead of losing kids out of their school into charter schools, it recaptures a segment of the school population that isn't currently in a traditional school setting. And so I think that Canby School District, ha they have a wide variety of programs and I think that they feel they have most areas covered to meet the, kids of, meet the needs of kids. And they haven't had a charter school proposal ever before. This is the very first proposal that's ever come across their doorstep. And so I think they're moving along with caution and um, we'll see how this, how this all turns out. I think there's some legitimate reasons too why people would be careful in um, thinking about having a charter school. You know, we want to make sure that our kids really are educated well, um, that everything that, you know, we want to see covered as they're growing up and learning that they can move on and go to college um, or be successful in, in some kind of trade or whatever they're going to do as young adults. So we want to make sure that the curriculum is really solid, that it's research-based, that we believe that it's going to be something that's going to help kids um, develop into successful, productive, young working adults. Um, and, you know, so I think uh, people want to look carefully at that. And then I think there is sometimes just a misunderstanding of where the funding comes from that people maybe don't want, as Dan said, things taken away from the schools that are already in a district. Um, but this is really uh, funding that is set, you know, it, it's separate because the money goes per kid wherever the kid is going. So if we're bringing kids back into the district, we're really bringing money back into the district. The school district gets to keep 20 percent of, of that money for each kid. And some of that money goes towards helping to support um, the charter school, but we're not actually taking money away from the district. Yeah. How can people help? We have a, a lot of ways um, that people will be able to help once we're approved. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, as I said, we had a great group from the community being involved in the, in the process of developing the proposal. Um, we believe in having a lot of um, parent involvement, but we also need involvement from the community in this model that we have. Uh, we want to be able, as we said earlier, to tie in all of our academic learning into real world experiences. So every Thursday will be a field day or a work day or a community service day. And so we're going to be needing to connect with a lot of people in the community to help us uh, make all of that happen. Uh, we also, you know, again, once we get approved, we will need some additional funding, although, um, you know, for some of our special events and, and um, some other things. So if people want to get involved by, by donating uh, financially or um, we'll probably have a list of things, you know, physical, tangible things that we need uh, from the community as well. Um, and lots of uh, volunteer hours and other ways. It will all be posted on our website once we're up and running. Yeah. All right. How do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century? I think that Renee um, hit on that earlier in that the um, studies that are showing that jobs that our children will be working in in 15 years don't even exist today. That they're brand new jobs we've never heard of and never thought of. And so instead of viewing children as a bucket that you fill full of knowledge. You want to view them as somebody who can gain knowledge and work with knowledge and manipulate knowledge. Uh, and so they are flexible enough to be able to move into the 21st century and fill the jobs that don't even exist yet. 
We want children to be able to think outside the box. We want them to be able to work with each other. We want them to be able to help get ideas from several other people and collaborate ideas because multiple ideas help produce better ideas. And I think kids that are in a charter school like the one that we are proposing uh, will be the leaders of the 21st century jobs. Is everybody in the communi community getting a fair chance to attend this school? Yes, everyone will have a fair chance to, to attend this school. It's a public school, um, so anyone is allowed to attend. Uh, if there are more students that sign up for enrollment um, by our due date than we have space for in a class, then we have to hold a public lottery. And so in that way, it's a fair choice. We aren't you know, picking and choosing who the students will be. It has to be done um, in public, in front of others, um, so that everyone knows that it's done fairly. Okay, are Hispanic kids afforded the opportunity to attend the charter school when it officially opens? Absolutely. We have in our budget, we currently have an ELL specialist. Um, we have uh, just a few hours set aside at this point in time, but if we had students who were um, English language learners, then we would increase the time that we needed uh, for that specialist to be there so that they were sure to be served in that area of need. Um, but again, all students that live in the community can come to our school. It's a public school and all students are welcome and we hope that all students will desire to be involved. Yeah. Do you think trying to meet the, f the future by doing what's always been done in the past, are we alienating millions of kids who don't see the, any purpose of going to school? I used to teach tennis to a group of kids that were homeschooled in the day because they had time in the day. So I had about 70 homeschool kids that would come to play tennis. And then the after school program was, was mo mostly public school kids. And the difference was stark to me. The kids that were homeschooled, um, for the most part, you would say, what's your favorite subject in school? And they'd say, oh, do I have to just pick one? It's between language arts and computer science. Or, you know, there was this love of learning that was going on, not in all homeschool kids, but in this group of kids that I was with. And then in the public school kids that I was dealing with after school in tennis, I'd say, what was your favorite class? And they'd say, lunch, you know, <laughs> recess. They had already shut themselves off to a great degree to the learning process. And they were just there to kind of endure and be with their friends. Um, our charter school, I think, will help children fall in love with learning. And our goal is to produce lifelong learners, yeah. kids that want to learn through their whole life. So we, if we can teach them a way to learn, then there's no stopping them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really the goal of, you know, our mission is to be able to create an environment where all students can be access successful. And to be successful, kids have to be engaged in the learning process and they have to be excited about learning. And there's some kids that just are naturally excited about learning no matter what environment they're in. But, you know, as you said, there's a whole lot of kids who, you know, there, there's something else maybe that will spark their interest or another way. And we're not saying, you know, I think Canby has a great reputation and there are great schools in the Canby district. We're not trying to replace anything or to say that we can do something better. What we're trying to do is to simply provide another option so that if there would be a, another option that's better for some kids, we want that option to be there for them as well. All right. Do you think the story is the same today? If you work hard, you do well in, in school, you go to college, you'll get a good job. Do you think our kids today believe that? I know my kids still have the American dream. Uh, maybe, but maybe by the time they hit 19, 20, 21, they run into the real world, maybe not but all of my kids still believe that they're gonna be you know, the most incredible NBA basketball player that's ever lived. Or you know, the American <laughs> dream is alive and well in our house. And so I think in school age kids, that dream is still alive and well. I think it's when, when the young adults um, hit the real world and find out the limitations that they have, um, or maybe the limitations that uh, in opportunity, that maybe that wanes. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that we want to do is to <clears throat> create more opportunities for young people to see all the possibilities that there are. Uh, because it is, it's a really difficult market out there right now. You know, the unemployment rate hopefully is improving, but 
you know, there's still a lot of people when they graduate from college, they're not getting the good job, no matter how hard they worked. Uh, but we want to, we want kids to be inspired by multiple opportunities, you know, and multiple ideas. So the more that we can expose them to, um, to the different kinds of professions there are and the different kind of work that is needed to make a community, a, a great community where you want to live and, and raise a family or, you know, be a part of, um, the more ideas that they can have. And I think that opens the door to more possibilities for them in the future. Because if you just think you want to be the NBA player and you never think about anything else, then you're probably going to be disappointed when you're 19 or 20. <laughs> You've met you my know? son. Yeah. <laughs> but if you, if you think, well, I could be an NBA player or maybe I could, you know, be a scientist or maybe I could be a teacher or maybe I could be a coach or, you know, wow, I didn't even know that, that this job over here existed until we went on that field trip. You know, there's all kinds of things that kids can do. And I think, again, you know, if we're talking about a generation that is going to be paving a whole new way in the future, they have to be looking at, at all different perspectives and all different kinds of ideas that they can weave together to, to create um, what's going to be 20 years from now. Yeah. My, I have a son that's 16 in Canby High School, and he has a class that's mandatory for sophomores called Future Focus. And it's the first time they start to explore what job might I want, what career might I want to pursue. And um, the kids in our charter school won't wait till they're 16 to ask that question. They'll be getting exposed to multiple types of jobs and multiple people who are in the workforce. And so I think by the time they reach 16, they'll have a good mm -hmm. solid idea of um, several ideas of directions they might take. Yeah, our kindergartners and our first graders and our second graders will be going out and doing field work and community service and, you know, at the appropriate level for that age. But as Dan said, the exposure is going to start young. And so they can begin experiencing the world in a whole different way. Yeah. Okay. Do you think the current education system was designed and conceived and structured for a different age? In some ways, you know, I think that teachers are continually, um, you know, teachers do a good job of keeping up with the times, so to speak, you know, so there are certainly some things that we continue to do that we've always done since education began. Uh, but I think that that can be in particular has been particularly innovative with some of their ideas. Um, and so I, I think in some ways things are changing. but. It is a question that we have to ask as, as the 21st century has rolled around. And again, we're just moving so fast forward into the future. Um, does it need to change even more um, than the changes that we've made? And how, what can we do to um, help those changes happen more quickly? Because the conversations might start you know, about the changes that are needed, but it may take five or 10 years to really get that rolled around. Uh, and then by then it's a whole new uh, picture again. So I think we do need to be asking the questions of, of what needs to change and how can we make those changes happen quickly and ensure that they're going to be successful. Do you think there is still an assumption of social culture and capacity, rich or poor, different needs? Well, I know that's a good question. Uh, the nice thing about the charter school that we're looking to um, have here on site is there's about 200 schools similar to this throughout the country. And some of them are in very, very poor districts. Some of them are, in, are very wealthy districts. But no matter where they are, this curriculum, um, the students perform seven to 10% better across the board, whether they're in a rich district or a poor district. So exposing children at a young age, <coughs> excuse me, to hands-on type um, activities and exposing them to the um, area around them and the culture around them um, really has some lasting impacts tests are showing. I think some of the other benefits that we would have here at the charter school is the small school size and the um, large amount of parent and community support. I think the more that we can um, 
help kids when they're young to have the confidence in learning and overcome the obstacles that they face, whatever those are, whether it's from the environment that they've come from or the things that they're facing actually there at school. Uh, the more that we can support them, um, the more they're going to, um, like Dan said earlier, begin to fall in love with learning and become lifelong learners. And that's really what we want to see regardless of um, the economic status. Yeah. Do you think there are current, that our current education model is designed for two types of children, uh, academic and non-academic, smart, not smart? I don't know, I, <clears throat> like Renee said earlier, I think that uh, schools have tried to keep up with the times, they've tried to be flexible, they've tried to meet the needs of many different types of learners. Um, I know some of the kids that I work with don't learn well in a sit down and listen environment. Um, they do much better if they were up out of their chair, putting things together, starting to understand how the world works. So for kids that, <clears throat> that are more hands-on learners, um, I think our current school system is much more challenging for them. I have this favorite quote, I have it on the front of the charter school proposal, um, but Kurt Hahn, who was the founder of Outward Bound said, we are better than we know. If we can be made to see it, perhaps for the rest of our lives, we will be unwilling to settle for anything less. And that's really the heart of the charter school is that we believe that there is much more inside of each student than they know or believe in themselves. And if we can just help them to see it, then for the rest of their lives, they will never be the same again. It's not a matter of labeling a kid smart or not smart, academic or non-academic. It's really about being able to look at a young person and really know them and find out who they are and who they were meant to be and helping them to see that and believe that about themselves so that they can face whatever challenges life brings to them and that they can be successful in whatever path they choose in the future. Do you think the current school, mo school model is creating chaos? Um, I think there's a lot of things <clears throat> that are contributing to creating chaos. I don't know that the current school model is one of the major factors. I think probably the deterioration of, of the family is one of the major factors. Um, parents having to hold down two and three jobs and not being home when their children get home from school is a major factor. Um, I don't see schools as a major factor in that. Yeah, from my experience as a teacher, I think schools, staff do the best that they can to try to unravel the chaos wherever it comes from and to help create stability in a place where students feel safe um, because, you know, they have to feel, students have to feel safe and they have to feel that it's not chaotic in order to learn. And sometimes we do a better job um, than at other times, but I think most teachers are really doing the best that they can to try to unravel that whatever might be chaotic, yeah. All right, do you think that implementing standardized testing has increased the amount of ADHD diagnosis in students? I have an opinion. <laughs> Renee, Renee is well, a I'm a special ed teacher, so, um, well, first of all, ADHD is a medical diagnosis, so it has to be determined by a physician. Um, so that that's just that you know there's nothing that that's necessarily going to impact the diagnosis of it more or less but i think that um, kids that are diagnosed with adhd um, do struggle more in a traditional model uh, because you know they want to be moving it's you know kind of the nature of um, of their disability is that it's hard for them to focus um, they need, you know, shorter amounts of time where they're doing just one thing and they need more movement. And so a hands-on learning environment for um, students in, in that scenario, not all, but, but for many, uh, would benefit them. Um, and I think that they would feel more successful. I agree. I don't think the standardized testing um, has an effect on the ADHD. I think it is more difficult for the kids that struggle with ADHD um, to sit through standardized testing. But I agree with Renee. Yeah. 
That being said, standardized testing is a requirement um, by uh, Oregon State Education standards, you know, so we can't get away from standardized testing, but I think in preparing um, students for taking those tests, um, helping them feel as successful as possible in the learning environment um, and throughout, you know, the weeks of just regular education is going to help them um, not be so overwhelmed by the day that they have to sit down and do that test. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think the, their ability to take in knowledge and process it and hands-on <clears throat> model really helps children with ADHD. So by the time they get to the standardized test, they're much more confident in their ability to, um, to accomplish it. So what sets this charter school apart from other charter schools compared to that outside of Portland? Well, a few things in my view, and then I'm sure Renee will help fill this in. <laughs> um, number one is the type of curriculum that we have chosen is um, not, it's fairly rare um, throughout the United States. Again, there's about 200 schools that have this curriculum. And because it is so um, hands-on and based on children's experience, um, then they learn it in a new way. And that coupled with being placed on a campground, it's like being at an outdoor school. Um, all week long, kids get a chance to get outside the classroom and experience the world um, firsthand. And therefore, um, education becomes more tangible and more real. Yeah, I, I agree. It's the, the experiential education um, coupled with the real rich, um, solid academic learning uh, where it's, it is a standards-based system. So. Um, students are uh, hitting all of the learning targets that are expected of them, but again, they're taking that knowledge and they're applying it. Every single week, they're going out and applying it in some way. So that's number one. The second one is the whole aspect of character and leadership development. So within the context of our school, uh, we're teaching kids to be learners and we're teaching them to be concerned about what kind of a person am I developing to be? How do I treat the person sitting next to me? What happens if I see somebody sitting by themselves at lunch? Am I gonna be the one to go over and, and to talk to them and to be a friend to someone who might need a friend? So every day we're going to be talking about these issues. Um, there's another quote that I love and it is um, that we are, we are crew, not passengers. So we're not sitting in the boat just kind of watching what's happening, but we're all in the boat together, working together to make sure that this becomes a community of people that we're happy with, that we feel safe with, that uh, we understand and know each person's unique um, strengths or weaknesses, and that we're gonna cover for someone's weaknesses and help them get stronger, and we're going to celebrate their strengths and, and uh, their successes together. And then the third area is um, the area of service learning. That again, our whole curriculum uh, will be uh, centered around a problem or a question or an issue that needs to be resolved. And so students will be um, not just going out and doing something that feels good to help someone, but they'll be understanding what the deeper issues are behind um, that issue like, why does this problem exist in our society? And what kinds of things have been done in the past to try to address this? And what kinds of things can we do in the future to make sure that this doesn't happen again? So those three things together, you might see um, pieces of them in different charter schools, but, but we're putting them all together in one place in this beautiful setting. You know, how, um, how many schools get to say, that you know they have how many acres 78 78 acres of you know forest and land that that we can celebrate learning on it's just a magnificent opportunity yeah if people are interested in learning more about this charter school where can they go yeah we hope to have a website up soon um pending approval uh, but right now we're on facebook canby grove charter school um they can just you know search for us there um, that's probably the easiest way to find us. And then uh, all of our, our phone number and email and information is all there. Um, if they don't have a Facebook, then I guess they can call, call the Camby camp. Grove. Yep, yeah. call Camby Grove and get some information that way. And what's the phone number to reach the Camby Grove Charter School? 
The phone number is 503-266-5176. So again, that's 503-266-5176. All right, final question. Is there anything else you guys would like to add about Canby Grove Charter School? Uh, the board of, of directors from Canby, the school board decides tonight whether to accept our charter or not. If they decide to not accept our charter, we have 20 days to respond to the reasons why they didn't accept it. If they deny our charter again, and then it goes to arbitration with the state school board. Yeah, we would appeal to the state and they would try to come in and mediate. I think the, the first priority of the state is to have charter schools functioning within a district. If there can be no resolution within a district, then the state can choose to fund us independently, or we could um, go through a community college. Yeah. All right, thank you for taking time out of your day to sit down with me. Again, this is Dan and Renee with Canby Grove Charter School. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.